Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Leadership Biz Cafe podcast. I'm your host, Tavi Nasir, CEO of Tavi Nasir Leadership. Looking for a keynote speaker or corporate trainer for your next event? Then visit our company's website at tavinasir.com to find out how we can help bring in valuable insights and practical tools to help your organization succeed in achieving its goals. And this episode is sponsored by GoCo. Connecting with your employees as a manager can be challenging. Thankfully, GoCo can help you with this by supporting your people with team feedback features built into their automation-based HR software. Not only can you make sure you're aligned with your employees on their performance, progress, and goals, but you'll show them that you care about your employees by providing them with a modern HR experience. You can customize the GoCo platform to support your existing processes, documents, and policies, and they provide you with a dedicated customer success manager to help you maximize the benefits you derive from their platform. And the best part is you can try it for free with no credit card needed. So go to goco.io slash leadership, that's G-O-C-O dot I-O slash leadership, and find out why Forbes has said, as far as all-in-one HR platforms goes, GoCo is your best bet to get started. And now, let's meet my guest for this episode, Michael Wade. And one of the common uh, mistakes I think that organizations uh, make is, is treating digital transformation at its core as a technology project uh, or a digital project. There's no question that technology plays a vital role in both our work and personal lives. And many organizations are naturally trying to capitalize on digital transformation initiatives to improve the way they operate. But is our approach and understanding around digital transformation too limited? Are organizations missing out on truly tapping into the real potential that digital transformation can have on the way we work and collaborate? It's a question that serves as the basis of my conversation with Cisco Chair and Director Michael Wade. Michael Wade is a professor of innovation and strategy at IMD and holds the Cisco Chair in Digital Business Transformation. He is also the director of the Global Center for Digital Business Transformation, an IMD and Cisco initiative. Before that, Michael was the academic director of the Kellogg Sulich Executive MBA program in Canada. Michael has been named one of the top 10 digital thought leaders in Switzerland, and he has published works on a variety of topics, including digital business transformation, innovation, strategy, and digital leadership. He's the author of more than 30 case studies and eight books, his latest being Orchestrating Transformation, How to Deliver Winning Performance with a Connected Approach to Change, which will be the focus of my conversation with Michael today. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, first off, Michael, I have to compliment you and your co-writers for writing a fascinating and eye-opening book about digital transformations in today's organizations. Admittedly, it's not a light read, but I think that's necessary for leaders to really get a better handle and understanding on what kind of digital transformation they should be advocating and driving. And there's a statement you make early on in your book that is a great starting point for our discussion, and that is that leaders need to move beyond looking at digital transformation in terms of their organization's offerings and view it more in the context of their business models, processes, and value chains. So could you elaborate more, Michael, on why leaders need to make this perceptual shift in terms of how we understand digital disruption and transformation? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. You know, we work with a lot of companies on their digital transformation journeys. Um, uh, I have a full-time team of people trying to understand really what digital disruption and transformation means for traditional companies and how they should respond to the opportunities and threats. And, and, and we see some good stuff and we see some horrendous stuff. Uh, um, and one of the common uh, mistakes I think that organizations uh, make is, is treating digital transformation at its core as a technology project. Uh, or a digital project. And now, clearly, this is an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, but in order to successfully transform, we see that organizations need to consider much, much more than just the technology, including some of those elements that you mentioned. So the organizational structure, how they engage with key stakeholders like the customers, partners, employees, um, uh, organizational culture. So a lot more than just the products themselves or services. Even though those are 
you know, often a very, very important central component of the transformation, they're not enough. This is certainly a completely different way to see and understand digital business transformation, Michael. For example, one common issue many organizations tend to focus on when they think of digital transformation is whether they should house their operational software and data on-prem or on-site or just move it to the cloud. But what digital business transformation should really be focusing on is driving organizational change through the use of digital technologies for the purpose of improving an organization's performance. In other words, it's less a question of where or what and more a question of why and how. That's right. You know, we make a distinction in the book between digital business transformation and digitization. So digitization is, you know, kind of what you describe. It's it's taking an analog process and digitizing it, maybe taking something that's on paper, putting it online, maybe, uh, you know, digitizing a process. Uh, this can be extremely valuable, actually, as far as, you know, in improving your productivity uh, and efficiency. But it's not really transformation. You know, the example you gave is, is do you, do you uh, host applications to data on site or off site? There's a technical piece to that. But it's also a more kind of strategic piece. You know, what does it make most sense to do? from you know, understanding your, your consumers better or providing better services to them or generating new sources of revenue or you know, pursuing a new business model. You know, if, when you start at that level, you realize that the you know, on-prem offsite um, uh, question is only a you know, relatively small part of the overall picture. And so we try to address the, the bigger picture in this book. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Michael, as one of the interesting stats you share in your book is how when it comes to digital transformations, only 5% of organizational change initiatives meet or exceed expectations. And as you point out in your book, one of the main reasons for this high failure rate when it comes to digital transformation is that most leaders don't understand the problem they face. So... What's the real problem leaders should be addressing here, Michael, as opposed to the one they think needs solving to improve their organization's performance? Huh. Yeah, well, that is the, uh, you know, that's the, uh, the million dollar question. It is. That's why I'm asking it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, we, we see that the, the well, we define uh, digital business transformation as organizational change through the use of digital tools, technologies, and business models to improve performance. So simply put, that's the, that's the objective is to improve performance. And one of the key insights, and it's, it's an obvious insight, but it's, but it's not often followed, is that you know, the objective of these digital transformations is not to be more digital. That may be an outcome, but it's not the objective. So, you know, digit, you know, becoming more digital is, is and should be a means to an end. You know, it's, it's a way to, to achieve some kind of objective. It's not the objective by itself. Um, so you, do, you define, you know, uh, your, your, your listeners define what the objective is. Maybe for them it's increasing revenue, maybe it's reducing costs, maybe it's increasing market share, maybe it's increasing NPS scores, whatever it is. And then the best way to achieve those objectives is to think about how digital can get you there faster. If your objective is to become more digital, you can by all means achieve that goal. All you need to do is give consultants a lot of money. And they will, they will get you there, but it will not necessarily improve your performance. Now, Michael, I often like to put myself in the shoes of some of my listeners who at this point might be a bit skeptical about whether the kinds of changes we're discussing here applies to them and their organization. And in your book, you do identify four types of change that an organization's leadership may choose to adopt. So again, to help put some more context around what we're talking about in terms of digital business transformation, could you describe what these four types of change are? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. <clears throat> so if we just step back a, a second, we, we spend quite a bit of time and energy trying to understand how disruptors are disrupting traditional companies. And we came to the conclusion after looking at hundreds of these companies that they're doing it by creating value in essentially three ways. They're creating either cost value, which is doing something that's <clears throat> cheaper and often uh, radically cheaper than the, than the existing alternative. The second type of value is experience value. So they're creating something that's 
somehow better, higher quality, more convenient, more secure, uh, uh, and so forth. And then the third type of value they create is, is platform value. And the strongest competitors, the strongest disruptors create all three. So if you could imagine a company like, like Amazon, you know, relatively low prices, even to the point where you don't check anymore, a good user experience, it just works, and an amazingly powerful platform. You can get almost anything you want uh, from that, including Prime, where you get all kinds of other, you know, uh, uh, intangible uh, uh, benefits thrown in or Uber or Netflix. You know, these are all organizations that have managed to create these three types of value. So then to get to your question, how do you respond to that? You know, basically, uh, there are four different response strategies that we've identified as a traditional company facing disruption. Two of them are offensive and two of them are defensive. And the truth is that most organizations, if not all of them, need to have a portfolio of these offensive and defensive strategies, not just about picking one or the other. On the defensive side, we have two strategies. One we call harvest, which is essentially learning from disruptors to, to, to be better at your core business, to what you're doing today, where you're making most of your money today. How can you improve, be more efficient? How can you... Uh, improve the quality of services that you offer, digitize? Can you block the disruptors, potentially? This is all part of the harvest strategy. The second strategy on the, on the defensive side we call retreat, which is either selling completely or retreating into some kind of a very high-end niche where it's very difficult for the uh, disruptor to enter. But being very, very good, Tanvir, at, at both these defensive strategies, really all it means is that you're lengthening the, the time until your inevitable death, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but if you want to grow, you need to move over to the other side on the offensive strategies. So there are two strategies there as well. The first one is disrupt. So how can you become a disruptor? <clears throat> how can you bring new forms of value to, to, to your customers or someone else's customers? And then the second strategy once there has been a disruption in the market somewhere, there, it triggers a battle to win or to occupy. So the, the, the final strategy is an occupy strategy, to occupy the space that's been created by disruption. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And I especially like your point about how it's not so much that we have to be binary in our approach to it, that it's an either or situation. Rather, it's about assessing what is the best approach for that particular strategy and where we are in terms of what we want to develop as our value proposition, market share, whatever it is that you're going to use to measure and define your success rates. I think this idea is especially important when we recognize how so many leaders are operating from a position of having an overwhelming number of urgencies on their plate, and consequently, there's the temptation to opt for the path of least resistance. And no doubt why I'm often asked by leaders for that singular solution, that set it and forget it option that can help them solve a problem and just move on to the next. So I think this point you brought up, Michael, is quite invaluable for leaders to understand how they should view change. And it's not easy to deliver, I, I can tell you that, because the capabilities to kind of improve your core business are not necessarily the same ones to do something quite differently. Well, you know, some companies like Google, for example, have actually separated to the, uh, the two. So their, their core business is, is Google. This is, you know, the, the, the advertising business. It's put in one bucket and then their more, you know, uh, disruptive type businesses they, they put over on, on another side, so all sitting under the alphabet umbrella. So they actually explicitly uh, separate those, those two elements. I'm not saying that's the right answer for every company, but they recognize the fact that there's two things that they need to, to do to compete and win into the future. And, uh, and, and so they've created these separate structures to, to manage each of them. So it's really important, I think, Tenvir, to, to not go too much on one or the other. One of the classic errors is, is for traditional companies to, to focus too much on the harvest side, on the defensive side, and not enough on the disrupt side. Uh, but you can also make mistakes the other way. You can focus too much on, this, on, on you know, the sexy new things and ignore the, the core business to your detriment. An example of that we've seen recently is General Electric. 
you know, they went whole, you know, all in on their, on their, their disruptive digital strategy and kind of, you know, overlooked a little bit their, their profitable core business. Uh, and, and, and we see the results of what happened there. Absolutely. And you actually gave me a perfect segue into discussing the title of your book, Orchestrating Transformation, and this fascinating idea you describe of a transformation orchestra. But before we touch on that, I wondered if, based on what we've discussed so far, Michael, could you describe what you mean by orchestrating transformation, as the word orchestra naturally brings a very clear image to mind? Yeah, and, and that image is, is one that we consciously chose um, because the, the, the way of competing today is, is, is more like managing an orchestra, I think, than managing a plan, uh, you know, a strategic plan. And, and most organizations have been built around, around this planning logic, you know, a three-year plan or a five-year plan. You set it up in advance and you set up milestones and budgets and so forth. And it tends to be quite linear and quite sticky, quite fixed. And in a fast-changing, unpredictable environment, all you know is, is there, you're going to be wrong. You just don't know how wrong uh, uh, that you're going to be. I think, you know, the change management methodologies that we've been relying on for many years you know, are quite linear. Step, you know, first step, then this step, then this step, then this step. And the problem is by the time you get to the third or fourth step, something's changed in the market. So you have to go back to the beginning. You never get to those final steps when you're actually, you know, seeing the improvements. So our, our metaphor of an orchestra uh, is, is it kind of challenges that, uh, uh, that logic where you've got to, on an ongoing basis, by the way, without the benefit of music that's written 200 years ago, you have to manage all the pieces of the, uh, of the organization in real time. And that's a, that's a difficult challenge. That, that, that's, a real, that's a real tough one. And, and that's what we really wrote the book around, how, how companies can orchestrate uh, their capabilities uh, in real time in the face of fast-moving, unpredictable change. I have to say, Michael, I love this idea that we have to shift our perception from seeing change as being this linear process and instead see it as something more nebulous, that it ebbs and flows over time. And again, that our focus shouldn't be on the what and where, but really on the why and how of why this transformation is needed and will improve performance, followed by how we go about achieving it. So let's look at your concept of a transformation orchestra. Now, organizations by definition are organized into some form of hierarchy or construct, both in terms of established roles as well as in terms of departments and teams. So how does this transformation orchestra fit into this? And more specifically, what's this orchestra made up of since we're not talking about a traditional musical orchestra? And following that analogy of a musical orchestra, what does a transformation orchestra play as its musical composition? Yes, that, uh, that's right. It's more like a, like a jazz band than a traditional, you know, concert orchestra. Uh, what, what, when we looked at, you know, really dozens of transformation journeys, some successful, many not successful, we actually realized that there are, there are there are a number of, of areas that need to be considered in order for these transformations to be successful. And we've already discussed on this podcast how, you know, the digital part is one part, but it's not the only part. So we tried to figure out, well, how many things, uh, you know, is it two, is it 10, is it a hundred? And the conclusion we came to after looking at these dozens of journeys is that there's actually eight things, which is good news for companies because it's not 20. But it's also not two or three. Uh, there's eight things that need to be considered in order to successfully transform. And so the orchestra is made up of these eight instruments across three sections. So maybe maybe I can go through these sections and instruments uh, if, if you wish. Oh, absolutely. I think it would be very informative. So let's start uh, with the first section, which is the go-to-market section. And this go-to-market section is made up of two instruments. Uh, the first one is... Uh, something we call offerings and offerings is well basically the products and services that you as a company offer to your customers 
And then the question is, you know, are those the right ones? Do they need to be changed, updated, reconfigured, digitized uh, in order to compete in the future? Um, so, you know, and, and, and there's a digital element to this, or maybe there's digital services that need to be offered and so forth. But, but basically, the question is about the products and services. Are they the right ones going forward or they, do, do they need to be changed? And then the second instrument in that section, the go-to-market section, is the channel instrument. So how you get those products and services to your customer. Does that need to be looked at? You know, this is a big question for a lot of companies today. Maybe they were traditionally B2B. Now they're going B to B to C, or maybe direct to consumer. Uh, maybe they're uh, uh, they're, they're starting to sell online for the first time. You know, this is a question of channel. Do you have the right channels in order to compete into the future? The second um, section is some is what we call engagement, and this is how you engage with three key stakeholder groups. The first one is customers. Are you engaging with them in the right way? Could you be more effective in your engagement? Are there digital tools that you can use to improve your engagement with customers? Uh, the second instrument is your workforce. So, so the people who work for you, are you really capturing their insights? Are you leveraging what they have to offer? Are you empowering them? You know, are you, because there's lots of great ways these days with digital tools to, to improve the engagement of your workforce. And then the third instrument is partners. So people in your ecosystem, of course, ecosystems are becoming much more important. Uh, so, you know, vendors and other partners uh, uh, that you might have in your ecosystem. And then the third section is something we call the organization section. And this is made up of three instruments. The first one is your structure we talked about this already your organizational structure how you organize clearly most companies were set up and organized structured to compete in a certain environment but is that still fit for purpose is it still relevant today with new competitive threats uh, that, that, are, that are that are appearing do you need to organize differently when it comes to digital do you set, set up a separate digital unit or or not you know these are key questions that have to be have to be addressed the second instrument on the organization side is incentives, rewards. Are you rewarding people in the appropriate manner to achieve the type of uh, behaviors and, uh, and, and objectives uh, that you're striving towards? You know, it's a tricky one because incentives are so important. We, we know that. So are you incentivizing people for the behaviors you want them to exhibit into the future or the ones that, uh, that, that were relevant yesterday or in the past? And then the, the third and final instrument on the organization uh, section is culture, culture and mindset. And when we are asked, Tanvir, you know, what is the main barrier to, to, to digital transformation? That's the answer we always give. Uh, it is mindset or culture. Is your culture ready to embrace the type of transformation that you're, that you're going to go to? So if we, if we take this metaphor of the orchestra as a whole, you go to see an orchestra, you don't just want to hear one instrument playing. And that is the case with some transformations. You know, the transformation is just making the decision of whether you put your systems and processes on premise or, or outsource. Or maybe it's, you know, engaging your customers with social media. This is, this is okay, but you don't just want to hear one instrument. You want to hear many instruments. But at the same time, if you go to an orchestra and all the instruments are playing, but they're playing their own tunes, then it's, uh, then it's just you know, a, a, a mess, a cacophony of sound, which is not what you want either. And for many of our listeners, I'm sure these are all things that they recognize as already being present in their organization, and that it's just a matter of redefining how we categorize them, which then changes how they work together. And this leads me to my next question, Michael. So in terms of this transformation orchestra, how do we then organize, for lack of a better word, this transformation orchestra within our organization? How do these three different sections you refer to, the go-to-market section, the engagement section, and the organization section, work and communicate with one another? Right. I mean, clearly you're not going to set up a new division, the orchestra division in, in your company. Right. No, the, the, the orchestra, you know, can sit underneath your existing uh, structure and process uh, landscape. It's more about a kind of a philosophy of managing change than it is a, a separate, distinct structure. And as we describe in the book, behind this orchestra 
are four elements that need to be that need to be orchestrated in order to achieve goals. Uh, there's there's a people, uh, there's processes, there's data, and there's infrastructure, and those sit underneath each of these of these uh, uh, instruments, and they can be you know um, uh, managed in an orchestrated fashion. So 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 you know companies that are successful in a in a digital world, a world of a lot of unpredictable change, are very good at at managing and sharing these four different resource elements. You know, rather than, you know, you gotta cut, you gotta cut those silos. You 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 gotta make sure that, that the data is is exchanged and freely available and that systems talk to each other. You know, so the, the systems, processes, people and infrastructure have to be very fluid you know, underneath, uh, underneath the, the, uh, the sections and instruments in this orchestra. Now, Michael, I know we've pretty much only done a surface dive here into what you cover in your book, and there really is so much more we could discuss. But what message or important takeaway do you want to leave our audience with in terms of how they approach these kinds of organizational change? Right. It is. And I, I think that's the first takeaway is, is in most cases, it is an organizational change initiative, uh, not just a digital initiative or an IT initiative uh, or, or a technology initiative. And I think that, you know, one of the, the main insights is to is to treat it as such and you have a, a better chance of, of succeeding. I think also. Um, you know, digital strategy is is also a, a trap potentially the companies fall into. You know, they set up a digital strategy, right? But I, you know, I'm not a big fan of digital strategy to, to be honest with you, because you know, why would you want two strategies? You have a digital strategy, you have an organizational strategy. You know, at, it's, at certain points, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna overlap. You know, they're gonna bump up against each other. So I think it's much it's much better to think about how digital tools and technology can make your organizational strategy more agile, you know, more responsive to change. So you don't lock into one, uh, one direction. I think, I think that's important. And the other thing, I think maybe the last thing uh, to mention is a lot of companies are, are digitizing in silos. Uh, so they're, you know, we're digitizing our supply chain or we're digitizing our marketing or we're digitizing whatever. Uh, and, and they do that for a very simple reason. It's easy to do it that way because you control, you know, you have control over your silo. But what we've learned about these digital tools and technologies is, is the benefit often comes with scale. You know, if you're putting in a CRM system, the benefit is not just in one department, it's across the organization, or you're putting in agile ways of working. You know, any of these things have benefit that can be leveraged across the organization across the silos, which is a, a much bigger challenge. And I think, you know, the orchestra tool is, is, is a good way to, is, is to help with that process of managing digital across the organization rather than just within a single piece of it. Fantastic insight, Michael, as is the case in your book. Again, it's a fascinating look at how leaders can be more effective in navigating change in our digital world. And there's so much more insight you can provide readers in your book on how to go about doing this. I know we didn't get into more of it, but I have to, again, compliment you on just a fascinating and illuminating read on change and digital transformation, if not also a beautifully illustrated book. So thanks, Michael, for coming on my show and sharing your insights on this very important topic. Sure, Tanvir. It, it, it's a pleasure. And, and uh, you know, it is a complex topic uh, and it's, it's difficult. It's tricky to put in a book. We're, we're actually preparing a, a companion field handbook uh, for executives, which is super practical, you know, based on the most common questions that, that, that we get asked and having kind of, you know, answers that have been sort of, you know, tested in the field uh, on, on, on very, very common questions. Like, for example, do we set up a, a separate digital unit? You know, these types of practical questions, we're putting together a companion uh, field book to help, help, uh, help executives to, with, those, with those kind of challenges and questions that they're facing every day. I agree with you. It is a challenging topic, but your book certainly does a great job addressing it. As I found, by the end of it, 
that it really helps the reader understand and view digital transformation to be separate from whatever tools you may be using or considering using, and view it instead from the perspective of what do you need to do in today's current environment to improve performance and increase the value that you offer to those you serve. So again, Michael, thank you so much for coming on my show and sharing these fascinating insights. My great pleasure. I hope your, list, your listeners, I wish them uh, uh, very good luck with their transformations and I hope they took away one or two things that they can help them along the way. I've been talking to Michael Wade about his latest book, Orchestrating Transformation, How to Deliver Winning Performance with a Connected Approach to Change. To learn more about Michael's work, check out the show notes for this episode on our podcast page at tavernasir.com slash LBC. And that's a wrap for this episode of Leadership Biz Cafe, brought to you by Tavern Nasir Leadership. Looking for a keynote speaker or corporate trainer for your next event? Then visit our company's website at tavernasir.com to find out how we can bring these kinds of insights to your organization, either at an upcoming conference, leadership retreat, or for a corporate training event. And this episode has been sponsored by GoCo. As we discussed in this episode, Digital transformation shouldn't just be about what digital tools you use, but about how to use digital technology to help you be more efficient in running your organization. And that's where a software platform like GoCo comes into play. Thanks to GoCo's team feedback features built into their automation-based HR software, you can be sure that you're not only aligned with your employees' performance, progress, and professional goals, but using GoCo's employee management tools will show them that you use digital tools because you care about your employees' growth and success as members of your team. And the best thing about GoCo is you can try it for free with no credit card needed. So go to goco.io slash leadership, that's g-o-c-o dot i-o slash leadership to get started. Now if you have any questions or comments, drop me a note through the contact form on my website. And if you enjoyed this episode, Please do share it with a colleague, with your team, or with your boss to allow them to reap the benefits as well. And remember, you can find all episodes of this show as well as links to subscribe on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, and Stitcher Radio on our podcast page at tavernasir.com slash LBC. So if you want to share this podcast with others, that's a great way to do it. And with that... I'm Tavin Nasir, and you've been listening to Leadership Biz Cafe.